go. Hi, my name is Deborah Luis, and me and my group will talk about the evolution and behavior of the learning Hydra. Why the Hydra's? In Greek mythology, one of the Heracles' 12 labors was to destroy the Hydra, a giant water serpent monster described as having nine heads, one head possibly being immortal, Venoma's blood, and poison's breath. The beast was an inhabitant of Lake Lerna during the time of the ancient Greece. The parents of the beast were Typhon, a monster with a hundred dragon's heads, and Ectina, a half-woman, half-snake creature. The creature's most striking trait is, gen is regeneration of heads. Every time someone would cut one of its heads off, two more heads would grow out of the stump. Creature's weaknesses, fire and gold. Fire, once the stump of the dead head was burned, the locust stem cells were consumed, to preventing the the degeneration of a new head. As far as gold, the hydra was destroyed one, only after Heracles used the golden sword to cut its immortal head off. Was one of the hydra's heads really immortal? Perhaps in that time and era, the Greeks didn't know that it's possible for a limb to continue twitching after it has been cut off from the body, due to muscles is due to muscles is spasm. Therefore, our group considered the status of the Hydra as an uh, extinct creature after Heracles destroyed it, destroyed it. And for fun fact, the freshwater metazoan Hydra of the Phelan Kinadra was named after the Greek mythology monster due to its ability of producing two normal animals after its body is cut in half. So now I'm going to talk about the evolution. Here we have a earthly biological evolutionary tree and we've included all our group's creatures. So on the left side near the horse, we have unicorn, pegasus, and hippogriff. On the right side, um, on the reptilian branch, we have the dragons. And um, evolving just after is the hydra. And then up on the bird branch, we have the phoenix. And then um, near the humans, we have Midna, a twilight. So closest to maybe a hylian in the Legend of Zelda realm in the realm of darkness. And now Serena P is gonna talk about this branch. Okay, so this is a, a phylogenetic tree of the Hydra. Um, it's believed that they have evolved from dinosaurs. And from there, they are thought to have evolved from a more recent uh, genus of dinosaurs and dragons called the uh, Aodraco Dawn Dragon. And from there, we believe the Aodrac the dawn dragons was able to survive cataclysmic events and outlive the dinosaurs. And due to harsh climates, produced many subspecies, in, included polycephaly. Mm -hmm. And from there, we believe that hydras were likely uh, descendants of polycephalic dragons. As far as its closest relatives, we've already kind of gone into this. Um, extinct dinosaurs, living reptiles, fictional other sea serpents and dragons of many different cultures listed here. And again, its parents were Typhon and Ictina. And um, it is reptilian, but due to its environment, it exhibits many amphibian traits. As far as analogous and homologous traits for earthly creatures, um, again, for the reptiles, it has um, poisonous properties, uh, basic limb regeneration, rough, dry skin cell scales. And as far as analogous traits, um, Early Nigerians, such as the Hydra, as Deborah brought up, was said to be immortal and not die no matter how many times you cut it, it would just remake another organism. And then as, long, uh, as far as amphibian goes, they do gen uh, show more CNS regeneration. So namely here, the axolotl, newts, um, other water salamanders of that sort. And here's the squamata branch highlighted in purple. Uh, this is another tree uh, out highlighting the shared traits of the mythical creatures. However, um, as far as analogous traits go, I would believe uh, sorcery was an analogous trait that uh, also occurred within dragons. It, they had their own draconic ma magic. Uh, as for, um, pyromancy is another analogous trait that is also seen in dragons and in some hydra. Um, uh, homologous trait would be poisonous scales and breath, rough skin, and regeneration, which can also be seen in both dragons and hydra. 
but not seen in other creatures. Um, how did multi-headedness evolve? We think similarly to how um, conjoined twins would evolve or other two to three-headed species we see today. So either a single embryo splitting partway or multiple converging into one. Um, we believe that due to the extreme environmental circumstances, it was able to have a total of nine. And um, this is typically today seen as not advantageous. It's more, most likely to happen in reptiles and for two-headed and three-headed snakes we see today, typically don't last long unless in captivity due to eating, movement, survival, and reproduction issues. All right, so the environment of the hydra um, is thought to be amphibious. It typically likes hot marshy climates. It's found in freshwater lakes, lagoons, and swamps. It'll dwell in the lenetic and prefrontal zones of lakes and ponds. It's typically cry cryptic. It likes to hide out in caves and other dark areas, and it's solitary. Uh, it's role on the food web. It's carnivorous. It's a tertiary consumer, apex predator. It'll hunt anything, including fish and species larger than itself. Uh, it may use multiple heads to tear apart prey. Um, not many predators are known, but it may be hunted by dragons and occasionally humans. And as Serena P. just mentioned, that dragons may have been a predator for Hydra. Um, so there might be an arms race happening here of co-evolution where Hydra be evolved to be become more and more poisonous to de um, so that the dragons won't be able to eat them. And then the dragon, on the other hand, will um, become stronger in immunity to poison so that they could eat the Hydra. This can be seen in a real life situation with rough skin youth, who is, which is highly toxic, but um, the garter snakes can still eat them because of this arms race. So we can see polycephony as an analogous trait. There are a lot of mythical creatures that um, have been observed and documented across different cultures with polycephony. Um, and here's uh, a few examples of how uh, these far related creatures have developed polycephalic heads as an analogous trait. So to kind of expand more on like how these creatures came, uh, became uh, polycephalic, um, so the causes of why is not exactly understood and it's pretty limited in research. Um, according to the BBC, um, higher water temperatures resulted in uh, development of um, two-headed zebrafish embryo, but the effects of why again is not quite understood. Um, similar observations were also noted in chickens where the batch of eggs exposed to uh, temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius had more abnormalities, including bicephaly. Uh, so hydras and creatures alike, uh, such as Skyla, which is a sea monster that you previously saw on the previous slide, uh, may have evolved to have multiple heads, possibly due to being exposed to higher temperature levels during their embryonic development. Swampy, marshy areas where the hydras um, exist are typically in warmer climates, so this may further foster um, ideal conditions for uh, having multiple heads. Interestingly, most commonly reported animals with polycephaly are uh, turtles and snakes, and this may be because uh, of the egg-laying nature of reptiles, which makes uh, the eggs more vulnerable to environmental changes, such as temperature, radiation, chemical toxicity, and etc. Another reason uh, of why uh, they're more likely to have um, or to be reported with polycephaly uh, is probably due to the sheer numbers of eggs they uh, reproduce. So to kind of like talk about those strengths and weaknesses, just to summarize what has previously been mentioned, uh, some of their strengths that they're able to regenerate two more heads when one's cut off, uh, they have poisonous breath and blood, uh, and some of their weaknesses is that um, they have lower survival rate due to polycephony, and um, it's very rare for them to survive past uh, embryonic stage and even rarer to make it to adulthood. They have low light vision and they're susceptible to fire and various uh, uh, spells, and this is important when we consider um, uh, what catastrophic events they're um, vulnerable to or resilient to. Hydras would be most result, uh, resilient to um, um, in most uh, natural catastrophic events, except for those that involve fires, such as wildfires, uh, explosive in the past uh, vol volcanic eruptions, as few lava, uh, as in the event that if it were to get its head cut off, the fire would prevent regeneration. Um, however, it could be resilient for a volcanic event with slower lava flow, um, where the hydra could be less susceptible from debris from volcanic ash, which contains very fine glass and rock fragments, um, which can be in the air and the water, um, and this can also make it difficult to breathe. And furthermore, the poisonous gases released from the volcano eruption can also 
make it difficult to breathe, but with the hydra, uh, they may be able to tolerate and breathe more toxic material than other species since it has also has poisonous breath. Um, in dire conditions, and this would be ideal for all like famines, uh, the hydra could potentially sustain itself through eating its other heads when there is limited availability in the food source. It has been documented with polycephalic snakes that snake heads um, may attack and try to eat one another. Um, and lastly, the hydra is also less likely to be predated and this could apply for all sorts of um, catastrophic events um, because um, of its uh, blood being poisonous, that could also reduce the amount of pre predators that uh, consume it. Um, and if invasive species become present in their ecosystem, possibly due to a catastrophic event, or if they were just introduced, it, it may be less susceptible to them as they're not adapted to tolerate its venom. So the behaviors are learning versus unsuccessful learning. Uh, for successful learning, they had spatial arrangement of the body as sufficient based on observation. Uh, so the central head controls other heads with great agility when navigating. So uh, they had low vision, so discrimination of color is limited and can detect movements very well, which may uh, apply to their successful learning. But they had a small cranium, cranium and brain suggested intelligence and learning was limited. Uh, their innate qualities are heat seeking, uh, cryptic and seek security and they are aggressive and will at attack near anything that approaches. Uh, they're super stimulus, they are low, low vision, suggest hydras will attack anything that moves, real or fake, and they incubate an egg that is not theirs if it looks similar to its size or hidden. For the life history <laughs> Lifespan legends say that it lives up to a thousand years. Um, this might be due to their size as um, solar like, metabolic rate um, is a general trend for larger animals and uh, thus having slowing the aging. Development, we um, based it on, on what is seen in, most commonly in reptiles because we decided hydras are reptiles. They had from eggs Youngs fend for themselves with innate inabilities, migrate or stay depending on the competition and resources and reach sexual maturity. And because they're reptiles, they have no metamorphosis. Um, for the reproduction, we hypothesize that hydras would have high parental investment until the eggs hatch and then a low parental investment. So high meaning that they guard and incubate the eggs, but then once hatched, they abandon the young to fend for themselves. This is thought to be because they have a lot of innate abilities. They're pretty self-sufficient, um, thus not needing the parental care later on. Um, and in regards of the R and the K strategy, for the R strategy, we decided it might be in between just because um, we hypothesize hydras would lay a lot of eggs, um, due, which is our strategy due to the fact that polycephaly species are less likely to be survive embryonic stage, which is what Deshna has mentioned before. Um, however, it, um, it later on can be a case strategy because once it's grown into adulthood, um, there isn't a lot of predators um, and they, ha they have a long lifespan. Um, so a stable mind and long lifespan defines it as a case strategy. Um, this is similar to a sea turtle where the survivability is high um, once the organism survives to adulthood. For select sexual selection, we decided um, perhaps pheromones would be something. Um, this is in regards of the Iberian rock lizards where the females, uh, where there's a direct link between um, male pheromones and immune cells and females decide which have a mating preference for a certain pheromone that ha that because it indicates that they have a higher immune cells, which is something desirable to pass down to the generations. Anatomy, there's um, most notable, there's the heads. Um, the number of heads can multiply via generation, regeneration, um, but one head I would like to mention, we consider as the main because once it's slashed off, it um, there's no regeneration, there's nothing, the body and the head and the rest of the heads die. Um, this all, all this heads converges into a body. And from a top-down view, we decided it's a radial symmetry because it generates identical halves around the central axis. And because this is a, um, it seems like it's a reptile and also more so it seems like a snake, we decided that they probably have a hydroskeleton. 
border nervous system. Is it centralized or decentralized? We had an interesting take on this in a sense that because reptiles are vertebrates and most commonly seen with centralized nervous system, we hypothesize perhaps that the main head and the body are a central system um, in a sense that there's direct control and direct feedback for the main and the body, but then it could be also decentralized for the heads and the main head. Um, similar to what we talked about with the octopus legs and the brain. So the main head would be the octopus brain and the other heads will be octopus arms where the main head will have a general goal and then um, the other heads will um, fine tune in order to achieve the goal and then feedback what's the most important for the heads. So in the sensory system, um, it had to have low light vision and possess dark vision, which allowed it to see it at 50, 60 feet, uh, smell and taste. It likely possesses a Jacobson order, which allows it to convert taste to smells. And uh, when it, this, uh, the Jacobson order will help it sense uh, prey, mate, and predators when it presses its tongue up against this organ from taking particles from the environment. Excellent. Uh, for hearing, they have a poor sense of hearing, uh, but they can detect low vibrations or frequency. Uh, special senses, they have some, uh, like some snakes, uh, they have a special sensory organ that lines the lips on either sides of the head. And this, uh, with this, they can uh, detect infrared radiation, which picks up the temperature of nearby creatures. Um, and it's extremely uh, sensitive to temperature change. So they can accurate, accurately sense prey in the dark. Uh, it is unknown why some reptiles specifically carry this trait uh, and not other organisms, but it's suggested that uh, it evolved to help uh, the, the hydra hunt and avoid threats in the dark. Um, for the bottom part, and here are some of the features of the hydra uh, in the art forms. And then as we can see, um, all the like hydra is like kind of like a snake like and then they move like a snake and uh, except like the circle one, it has like legs. So uh, next slide, please. So for their like primary localization, we propose that uh, they might move like snakes. So they have like four types of like prime, uh, local motion. Um, while it's like, if it's like a reptile, it's like kind of like this, uh, next one. Um, so, uh, but we propose that um, Hydra probably use like all four kinds of them, but like looking at the pictures of it, uh, it probably use the B one the most. Yeah, and, and it's like the, uh, the side winning one, yeah. And um, for like what kind of fixation pattern does it use? Um, uh, I think like when hydras uh, see something moves, uh, it attacks. And another one will be like that uh, they may incubate an egg that's no theirs if it looks similar in size or hidden. And uh, does it use central pattern generator for any kind of behavior? And we think it uses it for like locomotion and breathing. And then for example, like uh, on the graph on the left here, um, if it's like one part of the um, of the vertebrae is like activated and then the other part will like activate it accordingly. Yeah. Okay, so our extra question is, why are amphibious reptiles such as the hydra capable of regeneration while mammals are not? Next slide, please. We ask this because the striking trait that the hydra is known for is its restorative regeneration of its heads. Invertebrates and primitive vertebrates are capable of this type of regeneration. Dedifferentiation and cell, uh, stem cell activation are the main components for regeneration. Mammals are considerably less capable of regenerating parts of their bodies because they have less stem cells compared to reptiles. Um, regeneration occurs easily for reptiles because they have access to new cells via dedifferentiation. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the capacity to regenerate generally decreases during evolutionary development. The hydra, phylum, and planarian flatworm can regenerate entire organisms. Um, primitive ver vertebrates can regenerate substantial parts of their body, such as their limbs and entire sections of their brain. 
Reptiles can regenerate limbs and the ends of their spinal cord, while mammals only display basic regeneration like their hair, skin, and other inessential body parts. They only show reparative regeneration, not restorative. Adult humans can only regenerate certain parts of their brain, which is the dentate gyrus olfactory glomeruli. And as organisms evolve toward complexity, both structurally and cellularly, their regeneration capabilities become more restricted. Uh, next slides, please. Okay. And uh, here are our references. Thank you. Thank you.